And uh, we want to welcome, give a very warm welcome to all of you for making it out. Uh, this is our third annual Talk 20 event, uh, and so we're really excited about it. Um, <laughs> We're, we're really thrilled to, to once again uh, open up the office uh, and get in a lot of really great local designers, artists, architects to, uh, to show a bit of their creative work. Um, it's not only a great event to open up the, the studio and get everybody in here, a lot of our really great friends and colleagues, but um, to really kind of take a step back, get away from the computer, and uh, and really get inspired by some of the great work that's going on uh, right around us and uh, show a lot of the great breadth in the design community here. Um, so among our guest, guests this evening, we have sculptors, graphic designers, partner painters, digital media experts, and architects. And uh, every year uh, as part of this, we have a, a couple of our in-house BCJers that uh, join in on the Talk 20 presenters, so that's always fun too. Um, so if you were here last year, you know the format is really short. We try to keep it uh, very informal um, and keep the spirit pretty light. Uh, each presenter uh, is introduced by a BCJ architect. They have 20 slides and 20 seconds per slide. So that comes out to like six and a half minutes per and then you know run about an hour in the end. Um, so it, it'll all happen in pretty quick succession. Uh, we hope to keep questions till the end and maybe afterwards we'll just break up and have some drinks and food and, and we can kind of continue it into, into some discussion. Um, so yeah, here we go. First one. Hello. Um, so Abby and I met in college and we've known each other for I guess just short of 12 years now, which seems incredibly crazy. Um, Abby and I have been roommates, friends. I've known her as a swimmer. I've known her as a baker. Um, I've learned from her that Ohio is round on the edges and high in the middle. Uh, but above all, I think of Abby as a designer. And what I'm hoping that she's going to talk to us about today is how she's paired her probably more than mild obsession with food an amazing design background to co-found the company called Culture Kitchen. So Design Nerd and Fat Kid are two nicknames I have that I've uh, you know, paired together for this presentation title. Um, I became an industrial designer because I loved working with my hands and I loved talking to people. But when I started working professionally, I found that I was spending a lot of time in an office and really missed being out in the world, um, talking to everyone and actually building things. Um, but what I did have access to was a kitchen and I became increasingly interested in cooking um, and started to talk about food a lot. So much so that all my friends started to call me fat kid. Um, because um, I talked about food more than anyone they knew. Um, so, <laughs> um, fat kid is you know not the most PC term, but I think it actually does speak to you know food really is about love, and it talks about how um, mothers showing their love for their children through cooking. And it was around this time that I started to host what I was calling sugar high parties, where I would literally cook for or bake for two days and then invite people over to feast. And I'm not alone in this obsession. You know, you look at something like Pinterest, where um, the food and recipe site uh, or sections of the site have just taken off and people are um, dying to talk about their cravings for what they have made and what they want to make. Um, and this is just a quick search on Thai food that goes on endlessly. Um, so there's 11,000 people actively blogging. Uh, 11,000 people that are interested enough in food that they want to write about it on a regular basis, um, which is really interesting to me. And this is just English um, speaking blogs, so who knows how many there are for the many languages of the world. Um, and I started to learn about actual food designers, so people that were using food in really interesting ways to bring people together. This is Jennifer Rubel for a gallery opening. She formed cheese um, in the shape of heads, hung it from the ceiling, and used a heat gun to melt it and drip it onto crackers for people to eat. So you can imagine that the environment at this gallery opening was different than most. Um, so wor while working on my master's in product design, I kind of became preoccupied with uh, working with baked goods as a medium. 
and I had a couple different installations where I created a wall or a room out of hundreds of baked goods and sort of left it up to people to decide if this was something where they actually wanted to not only touch art but consume it. And the most interesting people to watch were some of the first ones. You know, I actually heard a woman say uh, to someone next to her, it's okay, I think you can eat it. I saw someone else doing it. Um, <laughs> And uh, so you, when you allow people to let their guard down, they start to do some really interesting things, like this. Um, and you know, he wasn't the only one. I have a series of photos of people doing things like this. And what was most interesting and exciting to me about this was that you can use food as a means to change people's perceptions about what's acceptable and their behavior in the process. Um, also while in grad school, I worked on a sanitation project in Kenya and I was spending a lot of time with uh, rural Ken Kenyan farmers just trying to understand them, um, what their lives were like and what was important to them. And while this was an interesting and meaningful project to me, um, what was most interesting to me was that when you would go into their homes um, and there's all this awkwardness of not speaking the same language and there's translators around, but when they would lay out the food that they prepared for you and you're literally eating it with your hands, um, you build a level of trust um, when you eat it to uh, build a relationship that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. And um, while I was having this experience in Kenya, my classmate and now um, co-founder Jennifer had a very similar experience in Myanmar. And it was this excitement that um, made us decide without a doubt that we wanted to spend our year-long master's thesis project with the mission to spread culture through food. Um, so we started spending a lot of time with immigrant women um, here in the Bay Area who um, had become uh, home-taught cooks, so masters in cooking. They learned from their mothers and their grandmothers, and they had mastered this skill just by cooking for their families every day. And to them, it was just something that they did. Uh, but what we wanted to do was help them realize that this was a really incredible skill that other people were interested in learning, not just about authentic ethnic cuisine, but the personal story behind the food. Um, so, you know, we started hosting cooking classes in a very familiar type way, you know, in a way that you would learn like you would from your grandmother, or at least the grandmother that you always wished you had. So, you know, this is a picture from one of our first training luncheons where we had cooks ranging from ages 24 to 64, representing 12 different countries. And what we saw was a huge transformation in their confidence levels and in their excitement to be a part of a larger community that was focused on spreading culture through food. Um, um, and seeing these huge effects that it had, not only on our instructors, but the students, we realized that this isn't something that we wanted to limit to the few people that could take classes in the Bay Area. And we wanted to be able to share these women's stories with a larger audience. Um, and we wanted our students to be able to uh, you know, make food, ethnic food, on a more regular basis. So um, one of the biggest hurdles for that is getting your hands on the ingredients to do so. Uh, so we took the best from our cooking classes, and every month we shipped that out. So each month we feature a different master cook, um, three of her family recipes, and all the hard to find ingredients for you to cook at home. So that you know you can make incredible Thai food just like this through the eyes of Sapawati. And you can share that with your friends and family. And it's through that personal connection when you begin to change your perception of other cultures and yourself in the process. So, uh, we have been shipping about one kit a month since January. Um, again, each month, each month featuring a different master cook, always through their eyes uh, for these different cuisines. And this month we're shipping Iraqi cuisine. Uh, and what's been really exciting to see is that our customers are falling in love with Baraka and her family and her food. And they're building a personal connection with a culture that is so different from the one that they hear about in the news. Um, and, you know, design is something that I've always been really excited about and what took me a while to figure out was how to find a way to use design that excited me as much as design. Um, and I never could have imagined that I'd find, um, you know, such a rewarding way as to use design to spread culture through food. <laughs> 